Hey everybody, this is Christopher Palaha. You're watching the Palaha Chautauqua. I'm your host, Christopher Palaha. I'm going to bring on a special guest to sing the uh, theme song. Just give me one second to... You know him, you love him. He's my boy, Caleb. Let's see if this happens. Hi, everybody. Got 160 souls in the first minute of the show. And climbing. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Samantha. Tracy's here. Katie's here. Sarah's here. <clears throat> Caleb, are you out there? Okay. Hey Caleb, can you can you go live with me, bud? You got to be on a phone, kid. see if he can do this let's see if we can do this. hey julian hey <clears throat> hey buddy welcome you, to the uh, palaha welcome to the palaha Shaka. lower his uh, phone a little bit so you can see his face julian yeah all right keep going a little lower he's kind of yeah. like you're not right in the frame yet there yeah. you go all right all right okay. go for it man. i'll sing it Life can be scary and sometimes hard Like you got the winning hand until you dealt the wrong card It ain't fair, but you're not alone <laughs> Down and out and The camera, guys! You gotta lower the camera! Who's holding the camera for you? Mama. Julian, you gotta lower it. Can you see him, sweetheart? No, because it's, it's facing me. Hey, turn it, turn it so that you can see. Hold on, guys. We're, we're, we got some technical difficulties on the plush taco today. I can't see him, sweetheart. You got to lower it a little bit. There you go. All right. There you go. Down and out and high and dry in the darkest valley or the coldest night. You'll fight. You're not alone. With the storm bubbling in your heart. Where is the storm? Give you brand new stuff. You don't have to tackle this big bad world all on your own. Cause it's better when we do it together. All mixed up and upside down feels like there's no one else around. It ain't right. You're not alone. Life goes south. Thank you for doing that. I know that's like, of course. I called you five minutes ago and I said, "Hey, <laughs> don't do this thing with me." And then I'm like, "Lower the camera." <laughs> no, it's sure. fine. I Happy to do it. it. Happy to do it. All right, see you guys. Bye, Daddy. Love you. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Polaha Chautauqua. Um, <clears throat> I love the humanity in that last little bit. I've got a special guest lined up. You met him last week. His name is Scott Morgan Morris, Scotty Mo, And um, we're going to talk about a whole series of things today. But uh, last week, I guess, or maybe even two weeks ago, my other son, Micah, interviewed his uncle, Scott, for a documentary that he's doing at school on joy. 
and um, the results, the happy result was turned into a YouTube video that you can find um, in Scott's, like there's a link tree on his Instagram page. If you go follow him at Scott Morgan Morris, you'll see a link tree. It takes you to the website. It takes you to all the stuff. Um, and it's definitely worth watching. It's a half an hour. It's Micah edited it. So it's sort of easy to digest as far as uh, there's a beginning and a middle and an end. And in it, Scott talks about joy and what joy is. And last week I brought Scott on to talk about the nature of, uh, really God's character and what it means to be created in his image. And we had a nice conversation about that. And um, Scott and I have had just, we just had a huge phone call before the show, just kind of warming up and getting some ideas on what we want to talk about. And it becomes effortless to drop into a really wonderful, um, deep conversation that's both philosophical, but also based in this deeper understanding of Jesus. Um, and I want to share that with you guys. So, with no further ado, I'm going to bring on Scott Morris. Uh, hang on one second. Right. <clears throat> Scott, welcome to the Chautauqua. What's up, man? I wish that you, I guess you can go back and rewatch this. You should see the look in your eyes. And when his head was like, well, yeah, now that was one look. That that was the look of, okay, we have to get together. But the other look, it was like hearts were coming out of your eyes. <laughs> so proud. <laughs> Unbelievable. I know what that feeling. It's just you're 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 almost embarrassed <laughs> because you're proud. And yeah. I face. And it was just like this guy we <laughs> lost. <laughs> we lost him yeah man it's so crazy because no matter how old i mean Folsom's five and you've got so you've got your you've got your son and you think that that feeling you have for him as a five-year-old is going to fade when he's 18 and like a grown man and stinky and right your right. shoes are as big as yours and you're just like but it doesn't like he's still it's crazy and, and we uh, we're thinking about when he leaves for school next year and it breaks my heart like almost daily i'm just like i'm already grieving oh his his like departure for college and i want him to go and i'm excited for him to go and start his own life but man it's like which you know ironically sort of ties really beautifully into the conversation that we were having right before about grieving life i had this thought to that. I don't mean to jump straight in, but let's, we might as well. Um, I was walking in the sunshine in Vancouver today and I was thinking about people who are, I used the word depressed, but you, you used a different word. What did you, do you remember the word you used for it? Uh, despair. Despair. Who are feeling despair. And I was like, I wonder if those people aren't just extremely sensitive and as they move through the world, they're aware of the fact that every moment is dying, that every moment that they're fully enjoying and living in and the relationships that they have and the love they're feeling is aging and moving past. And all of a sudden, these people start looking behind them to like remember the thing that they were really enjoying. And that feeling is the feeling of despair or is the feeling of, of what depression is versus this idea of, of looking forward. And I think... You know, with Caleb, it's like I could, I can already sense the the grief and the loss of of the the family unit. We're this group of five people, and we move through the planet together. And we are, con you know, us like we move together like a little troop. I mean, we're all, we're a tribe. We just move. We we go grocery shopping together. We we do a lot of stuff together. And when we're one man down, it, it's going to feel very different. You know. Yeah. Um... It's horrifying, really. I don't want to contemplate it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, so for example, with this video on joy at the opposite yeah. spectrum. Yeah, yeah, talk to me. Well, so I tell people, I'm like, you got to watch it because my son plays uh, Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth on the piano. That's the intro theme music. And then at the end, watch past the credits because he's actually playing live. You can watch him play piano. And it's sort of like, and you don't have to really pay attention to the 30 minute interview, except Micah did a great job editing it. But the main thing is my son Folsom 
right and it's like you're so heavily invested and so he's also playing it backwards by the way he's like he plays it backwards that's right he's like he's yeah. like he's not even facing the piano <laughs> yes and and that brings you joy that, that brings you joy um but i you know what i use despair because i think that depression has come to in our culture it seems to be a clinical term and we immediately think about there's something wrong with us chemically and we medicate to get better and people do need to go on medication when their brain is not functioning correctly and they are depressed but despair is an umbrella term for me that includes depression but despair speaks to the the healthy response that one has to circumstances that are are brutal and bruising and painful and you would be you would be mentally incompetent if your response to certain situations was to say oh who cares no big deal right so that that's despair when a situation is one that grieves you and that wounds you and hurts you you're in a state of despair and, and depression is a part of it. But the, the, I was just <clears throat> wanted to draw attention to the difference. It's not something, it, let's say that you could medicate your way out of it. Right. That's not a very good idea because you're just delaying dealing with whatever circumstance it is that has wounded you or has hurt you. And that has to be acknowledged one way or another in, you, in order for you to be a person who's not hiding from yourself and hiding from circumstances. Right. Do you remember Nikki Deloche? Yes. Yeah. So I was hanging out with her yesterday and she was saying, she was like, grief is a whole lot of pain coming at you in an instance. And so you're learning, you're getting a ton of information quickly. And it's almost like when you stub your toe, your body's like, oh, and you hurt and it hurts so bad. You're like, don't do that again. And the same would go. The same would go for grief, or the same would go for the kind of trauma that we experience. What do you think about that? Do you think it's? Do you think that? Do you think that? When somebody grieves, do you think they're the same person after the grief than they were before the grief? So, grief is a kind of despair. Grief is different, though, than. I think what a lot of people suffer from is they look around at the world and it seems to involve far too much suffering and pain. And not only are they aware of the fact that other people are suffering, other people are losing loved ones, um, but then they've even had personal experience of those kinds of pains. And there seems to be a lot of confusion in the world. And we are told culturally that there is no right or wrong, that there is no lodestar, there is no goal, there is no place that we can risk ourselves in getting to because everything is just a matter of opinion. And so the kind of thing that formally one would recognize as worth living one's life toward and even losing one's life for is reduced to uh, the difference between whether you like uh, McDonald's or Burger King. Right. And so in such a world, because we are born with a desire for accomplishment and meaning, in such a world, it is very easy to experience despair. And then confusion and what, what to do with myself. Like, what am I supposed to do with myself? I want to believe that I matter, but how do I matter? And those things, those things lead to despair. And, and in those cases, you know, you can medicate your way out of it. You can medicate your way out of it by going to a psychologist and getting a prescription. You can medicate your way out of it with pornography, with alcohol, with drugs, by watching um, cable television and just clocking out, by watching TV shows, Netflix, anything that dulls your awareness of the world and absorbs you in this exclusive way where you're not alive anymore to what's going on. You are totally tunnel vision focused on something. And for as long as you're in the grip of that thing, you don't have to worry about the really 
big problem that you have, which is that you're not sure what to do with yourself. And so you're, you're depressed, you're full of despair. And so the first thing that you would need to do is to find an answer. You know, is it the case that it's all up for grabs? Are, are major life decisions just matters of opinion? Is it the same thing as I like the Big Mac and you like the Whopper with cheese? I mean, is that what it's all about? Uh, and I'll say, I'll say this, the interesting thing about that is that whatever the case may be philosophically, and we don't have time to get into a philosophical debate about why what I'm saying is right, I believe that it's right, and if I had a debate, I think I can, I could, uh, I can handle it. I think I the answers. Well, I think I, can, I think I can. I think I can back yeah. up my argument. So, like, <laughs> tabling that, the justification for my beliefs, um, isn't it an interesting thing that even if there there is nothing beyond just the opinion of these highly evolved creatures, if there is nothing that exists in the world that has objective value. If that's the case, it is interesting that human beings long for that to be the case. That is peculiar in the extreme. It is also peculiar that people who possess joy are people who do believe there is a rhyme or reason. Things matter, that your life matters. And so off they go, charging in that direction to make a difference because they believe. So that in itself is interesting as a life strategy, whatever the truth may be, people who are able to get past their despair, I mean, for, for one thing, and, and it's not one thing, it's like one of the main things is if you believe that there is an objective, that there is something that must be accomplished that is paramount, of utmost importance, and, and along the way, in getting that done, you have battles and you have defeats and you have setbacks. And finally, you're in a state of some confusion about are you on the right path to get there? And you have despair. You're depressed because so far you haven't gotten there. As long as you believe that that objective, that that goal is of utmost importance, you will may take a minute, it may take a week, it may, you may go through a few months. But as long as that is shining and clear in front of you, you will shake off that despair. In fact, what you will get to the place is, I just don't care how I feel. I'm going to make this happen because it's that important. And then suddenly, what does that trigger? The release from the despair. Interesting. Two thoughts come to mind as I hear you talk. One is, one of the things, the unspoken things that we that we wrestle with day to day and whether or not we want to like talk about it out loud, but something that this show has been, it's always been the cornerstone of the show because if this thing started during the pandemic right. when watching death just ravage the face of the earth, like a monster. I mean, people were dying left and right to be aware of the fact that we are dying and that we have a finite amount of time on this planet and that it can come at any moment, I could be walking down the street, I can step off the corner and a bus can hit me. My brother was, you know that John was a bus driver and they told him, if you've got a hundred people on the bus and someone's jaywalking, you can't stop because you're gonna hurt a hundred people. Like you have to keep going. Uh, hold on. <laughs> I'm gl that, glad that as a pedestrian. As a pedestrian, you people should- Why were should... informed that the bus driver is going to hit the gas? <laughs> you know, Bus driver is going to keep driving. So if you're in a street, in a city, yeah. the buses are, you wow. don't get out of the bus. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, no, that's what we were told. We were told to like not, you know, you can't, you can, you can slow it down. You can serve, but you got to protect the people in the bus. So if, if we can die at any given second, that then becomes the thing. That's the clock. That's in a script or a screenplay. You've got this ticking time clock and you've got, you've got, to, you've got, to, you've got to accomplish the things you've got to accomplish in a matter of a given set of time. So that's, so death is the ultimate time clock. And then this other thing that you mentioned, I remember, and I've told you the story. So I went to boarding school and my freshman year, I was miserable. I mean, I called home crying every single night. I was so homesick. I was really desperate and sad and in despair and grieving all the things. And I remember this kid was, and this is an interesting time to talk about this story because there was a kid who was being anti-Semitic to my roommate, Jake. 
And one day I stood up for Jake and I took a broomstick and I smashed it through my windows in my, in my dorm room. But then having destroyed school property, I was like, oh, now I'm the guy who's going to get kicked out. So I'm weeping and I go to the nurse and she sees my hot tears and the red face. Smash the, the What's window. that? Out of anger, you just smashed the windows? Yeah, I was like, get out of our room. And I just like oh. took the broom and smashed it out of the windows. I was like, yeah. get yeah. <laughs> Cause I couldn't the kid up, but then I knew that was gonna be worse. So I like, I took it out on the windows versus this kid, but it was really just like, I'd had enough. Like I'd had enough. Like if I, I I've told you the story, but the I things that he, say it again. I still do that. Break windows? <laughs> Broomsticks? Automatic. I'll take a broomstick and shove it through the windows. It's the greatest way to relieve stress. <laughs> Every time. So anyway, I went to the headmaster and the guy was like, what's going on with you? And I said, I'm just not doing great. And I didn't want to rat it out, rat out the kid. But, but he said, you need to set goals. I want you to hit a certain grade point average. I want you to get involved in an after school program. I need you to get invested in things that you can focus on and feel that accomplishment, that little task. Like, you wake up, you make your bed in the morning, you got your first task done. It starts to lead to the, the feeling of accomplishment throughout the whole day. And to hear you talk about a purpose-driven life reminded me, and I know you're not talking about getting a certain GPA. I know that what you're talking about is much bigger and a lot more important, having a true north and, and choosing to believe in something and moving towards that for your whole life. Um, but it's weird how when you bring it down to scale, it really has a powerful effect in a life, you know? Right. So I think an important distinction to make between despair and grief over the loss of a loved one. Sure. That is a different journey. Um, and we're talking about the kind of despair that a lot of people experience and not someone who has lost a loved one. And, and we should probably, I'd love to talk to you about about grief, the kind of grief that you experience when you lose someone you love, because I've experienced that. And that's a whole other thing. Um, a whole other thing. I, you see, I pause because it's, uh, it's an experience unlike any other, unlike any other. And it's very difficult to communicate it to someone who hasn't experienced it because they don't know what it is, what it's like. Um, it's so destabilizing. And I remember that a friend of mine, an older friend of mine, when daddy passed, he said, it'll be a while before you can grieve. For now, it's going to be shock and awe and trauma. And, and that, that was true. So that's, that's almost, I would describe it as an otherworldly experience, that kind of grief. But the despair that we run into, whether you're 17 years old or 70 years old, or just it doesn't seem like it matters, it doesn't seem like you matter, you don't feel like you can plug in and make sense of things and make your life count. Maybe you even get to the place where you think, even if I could make my life count, it doesn't matter. You know, even, I mean, that's, that's like one of the deeper levels of despair is where if someone were to come to you and say, well, you remember you had been longing to be a famous singer or you had been longing to start your own business and I'm gonna make that happen for you. And then you reach a point, you're like, not anymore. Not anymore, it doesn't matter. You know, that's like scary, dark, but lots of people get there. Um, and, and to that, and this is a lot, I, I love this conversation because it's the flip side of the joy conversation that I had. Right. Right. But to that, I mean, what I said in that interview, one thing is that it happens to be the case for whatever reason, we'll table the philosophical justifications. It happens to be the case that people who are joyful are people who are very directed toward other people. They are outward directed and people who experience a lot of despair tend to funnel everything down onto themselves. I'm not talking about selfishness, although selfishness will cause you to be a person filled with despair, ultimately, or an angry person, or a person. But I'm talking about where you didn't make a decision to be selfish, you just found yourself in this deep depression, and all you can think about is your despair. So it's not like 
you don't care about other people in the way a selfish person does. It's that you, you're hurting so badly that you're sort of like, well, what could I possibly do for someone else? And, and then you begin to feed on, well, what could make things better for me? And maybe it's getting a new job, it's this, that, and the other. And those things can be really important. But ultimately, you know, you get a new job and then that one is not what you hope for. And you, you get a divorce and you meet and you're like, this time I've met the man of my dreams or the woman of my dreams. And then they turn out to be a dud or you're a dud or, or whatever. I mean, some combination of the two. So you're just up, down, up, down, up, down. To add to that real quick, it's also those moments when people, you know, I've done this, I've had this experience to myself, but when you pull back a little bit and you expect people to rush in and they don't, and then you're like, right. uh, and all of a sudden the, the lack of, you know, the lack of the Calvary arriving when, when you don't show up to the party with your, you know, your, your best self, you're like, oh, I'm not missed. They don't need me. And then people find themselves getting smaller and smaller and smaller versus fighting through that insecurity and saying, you know what? It's not about the fanfare or the what I can bring or it's about me literally connecting to other people in a really selfless. And it's interesting to use the word selfish because that selfless way of without expecting return, without you're not you're not doing something to get the the pleasure of any kind of return. You're just giving it away to people like pouring out. No, that's, that's exactly right. And it happens to be the case for whatever reason, those reasons are important, but we won't get into them, but it just happens to be the, a truth about human beings that human beings who are engaged in benefiting other people and human beings whose eyes are directed toward other people and their welfare and their flourishing, those people tend to be joyful. It's just an interesting fact of human nature. And when you find joyful people, you are going to be looking at people who spend a lot of time in service to others. And of the many reasons when someone says, well, why is Jesus your guy? Of the many reasons, and there are many, but one is that he practiced that so perfectly in such a healthy, poised way in engaging in radical acts of love for other people. And we were talking, uh, you and I were talking on the phone earlier, uh, Jesus purposely delayed getting to Mary and Martha to pray for Lazarus, Lazarus. and so he died. And, and he did that, not unwittingly, he didn't want to get there until not only was Lazarus dead, but Lazarus had been dead. And that was the scope of that miracle. And Jesus was aware of what was going to happen. And yet when he sees their grief, even knowing that this guy is going to come out of the tomb, even knowing that he didn't laugh and say, oh, you guys wait and see what I'm gonna do for you. He wept, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And why? Because a joyful person, when they see someone's pain, they're highly empathetic and it's very easy for them to drop down into that pain because that's a way of loving someone, recognizing their pain. But then here's the other thing about Jesus. He doesn't leave you there because then Jesus performs the miracle and Lazarus comes back to life. And so one of the reasons why Jesus is my guy is because he practices this way of life perfectly. He is the example. I mean, you can, pick whoever else you want in the world and put that person up next to Jesus. And that's not going to be a flattering comparison. In fact, the only people who could even come close are people who are doing everything they can to follow Jesus. <laughs> right. So, so, so what, what Jesus does is he weeps when he sees your grief. And if he has to, he's going to sit with you. But at a certain point, he's going to say, stretch forth your hand and take my hand and I'm going to take you somewhere. And where is Jesus going to take you? Well, he's going to take you to a place where he says, fishers of men, open your eyes and look at all these other people who are hurting the way that you've hurt. And through me, I'm going to give you the power to make their lives better. Does that sound like something that you're interested in? And, and by the way, that's if you are in pain and experiencing despair, one of the great benefits of it is that it gets you to a point where you are willing to say, God, what do you want from me? Because I'm at my wit's end. 
I'm at the end of my rope. I've tried everything. You have to get to the place where you give up your desires and your own goals and your sense of wanting to achieve. So this is not something that can be packaged in a get rich quick program. It can't even be packaged in the sense of, of a motivational speaker who's trying to tell you how to have a highly successful life. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. Jesus asked you to lay your life down and through what we call supernatural power, through the power of God, he will raise you up. And then you have to follow him though. And you have to say, what do you want? And what he wants is for you to engage in radical acts of love for other people. And that's where he's going to take you and lead you. And when you do that, you will be joyful. And what does that look like, man? I, I, I want to play a game at the end of this hour, which is let's list off all the world leaders <laughs> and then compare them to Jesus, because that would be an interesting list. I mean, you can think of Mother Teresa, you can think of Gandhi, Eba, like all these people. And you're like, yeah, they all like studied Jesus. And well, they I'm not going to name names, but let me tell you something. I, I, there are people who are highly revered to keep the, in the American context, apologies to people who are watching from other countries, but I'm sure you could do this in whatever country you're in. So there are people in our country who admire political leaders to an extent that is unhealthy. There's a, a section of our population, both on the left and the right, and they have their, their heroes and their admiration for these heroes is quite unhealthy. And, and, and each would say, and what's funny about them, they would say, well, I would put so-and-so next to Jesus, or I would put my so-and-so, my political leader next to Jesus, and then they would explain away the things that are obviously unchristlike. And I'm not going to mention names because people are going to start doing that. They're not going to listen to a word I'm saying. They're like, yeah, but my guy's not guilty of that. Here's what, here's what the both, both of these guys are guilty of, okay? Inauthentic living. They're not authentic people. They're not remotely human or recognizable. And Jesus, to me, one of the outstanding things about Jesus was his poise, his mental health, his sanity, his sense of humor, his understanding of what the world amounts to and what he was there to do and so there's no there, there's there's i mean there's no self-aggrandizement a la napoleon a la most political leaders of our day right and but they're just not authentic they're just full of it you know so you and i'm talking about both sides of the spectrum and I, well no my guy is being jesus because he's engaged in this policy your guy's not authentic right. he's the one crowd and he picks up an accent, he speaks to another and he has another accent. He speaks with one group of people and he talks one way and he goes to another group of people and his yes is not a yes or her no is not a no. And so there's women as well. So, you know, that's the thing about Jesus is that he's authentic. Right. And he demands authenticity of his followers. Who are supposed to reflect that. Right. So my second question is, <clears throat> what do we do? What do we do? What is the daily practice for radical acts of love? Where do I, I mean, you and I had a conversation two weeks ago that was a radical act of love. It wasn't, it wasn't this big dramatic. There was no like, it wasn't, we're not talking about interventions. We're not talking about, but we're talking about sometimes that means having a conversation with somebody that you don't know how that's going to be received and you want to just be the person that they sometimes it means just listening but like in your mind when you think about it what are what what can what can people do right who are listening to this right now and they're like yeah this is all great but like what do people do what's a radical act of love in your mind so first of all i would say if you find yourself in despair and you're thinking, you know, could this be a way out of, of despair or confusion or just a sense of meaninglessness? The first thing to do is acknowledge where you are. And, and that's why I have started a company called Sackcloth and Ashes. And uh, we can roll a, a, a telephone number up. I have an 800 number. I have a, a bank of operators waiting to receive phone calls. And, and you call them for a, for a nominal amount you get sackcloth and, and ashes. And so you wear the <laughs> weeks to work. You have to have the hotspot to be able to do this. And then you, so that's the way you've identified yourself as someone who is experiencing uh, despair. So okay. you start there. Okay, now. Do they tear, do they tear the cloth and ashes? Yeah, that's how you 
yes, at a certain point, like you taking that broomstick and breaking the windows, you you rent to King James, you rent the garments. Right. And but for women, obviously, that can be a risky proposition. So the men just rent, you know, the garments like that. And the women, I don't recommend that. It's more like a maybe tearing the sleeves or something. There's a pocket. Hey, have you I don't mean to I want to I want to I want you to keep up with your company. Have you seen uh, Fablemans yet? Steven Spielberg's new movie? No. Uh, Dude, uh, you, ha you have to go see it. I'm interested in what you think about it, first off. It's the most personal thing he's ever made. And I know people either love him or they don't. But there is this one scene, and it's Judd Hirsch. Do you know that actor? Mm -hmm. And he plays uh, Steven Spielberg's uncle. And this guy comes, and he was in, a, he was in the circus, and he, like, you know, he put his head in a line. But he talks about art. And he talks about family. And he, there's a scene where he's like, he's because the grandma died, his sister, you know, the uncle's sister died, and he's like, and he, he does this moment of grieving, and he, he and, the, and the Steven Spielberg character's like, are you okay? And he's like, what? You've never seen a man grieve before? He's like, you gotta rip your shirt, you gotta go, and he does this. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful moment of like, what it used to be to, that's because I think that's you're actually onto something like. People don't even know how to grieve anymore. We don't know how to move through the world. And we don't have those observational moments where it's like, ah, she's in grieving. Like, remember widows had to wear black for a year? Yes. That doesn't I happen. Remember that. I know of it. I, but you just asked me a, 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 a very practical, do you? Yeah, remember? do you? <laughs> yeah, I guess when I was little, when my granddaddy died, I was in sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade. So I'm 10, 11 years old, and I was very close to him. He was a, a you know pioneer guy. I'm a fifth generation Floridian on my mother's side. That's her daddy. He would take me in for a ride in the tractor. Remember when I got stung by a wasp? He just pulled his bit his cigar off and put the tobacco to draw the poison out. And you know it was like like epic granddaddy. And um, and when he died, I was really shaken, and I, I my mother was grieving so hard that I. I was able to kind of get free and I, I went up to the casket and I just stood and I kept looking at him, expecting him, you know, to overcome that just as he had overcome everything else because he was, I idolized him. And there were three women from his generation and they came up and I was standing in a way so that I wouldn't block the line of people who were coming to, to pay their, la their last respects. And um, they wailed out and I, I mean, blood curdling shrieks and they, passed out and you know the men are coming forward who were prepared for it because they had these little like silk napkins to cover you know below the knees and it's very old school but they were ready when those women hit the floor i mean they that's not something that was unusual so you're right i mean we have we have taken a lot of a, a lot of um those those rituals that allow us to express our grief and allow other people to acknowledge our grief that you're good, right? To be a cool cue to be like, oh, she's, yes. she's going. Yeah, and and that's why I've started this company, Sackcloth and Ashes. It's actually not a bad name for a company. Uh, now we're gonna do it. <laughs> the more you talk about it, the more <laughs> like it actually should be a company, and it could, <laughs> yeah, it could be. If uh, yeah. we're, it's 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 a, it's time has come. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> Away from vaping back to actual cigarettes, it could be like a. Um, but, the, but the steps you were asking about, like the 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 steps of of getting out of grief. Yeah. Um, the, the, the 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 and no, you were asking about the steps of how you engage. I just want like radical, radical love, radical yeah. love. Like if you were like, what what is an act of radical love that someone's expressed to you? Okay, like, so. So I will say that there are people who are just temperamentally, they have a certain kind of constitution and character and they can on sheer willpower be friendly, benevolent, helpful people. Mm -hmm. And if the world were full of people like that, we would live in a much better world. However, that's not what I am talking about. I'm talking about something that is available even to people like me who are much more passionate and turbulent and likely to, 
get really bothered by things that are going on. And so one minute, maybe I can engage in being very helpful to someone and maybe the next minute that I can't. And I think that most of us experience this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about is something that when you set your mind to follow Jesus, the obvious thing is, first of all, you have to know everything that you can about him. You have to accept him as Lord and you have to put him as your ideal. But all of that sounds like something that you could do with Winston Churchill right. or Abraham Lincoln. And indeed you could if that was all there was to it. The thing about following Jesus is that Jesus says that you will have the power of the spirit of God. And he says, when you engage in radical acts of love, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be in the midst of them. What serve you do unto the least of these, my brethren, you are doing it unto me. And so we are talking about something that is supernatural. And so part of that is Jesus, it's not often commented upon because we're dazzled by his ministry and his teachings, but he spent enormous amounts of time in prayer, enormous amounts of time in prayer. He was constantly vacating any commerce with other human beings and going to be alone. He would pray often all night long. So he was very prayed up. He was loaded up on God's perspective on his life and God's priorities for his life. So what I'm talking about, you can engage, you cannot engage in those radical acts of love that I'm talking about just by being a person of good character who is benevolent and who likes to see good things happen in the world. Again, I freely acknowledge the world would be a much better place if there were more people like that. But what I'm talking about, you're not going to last very long. You're going to come up against ornery people. You're going to come up against evil. You're going to come up against bad days when you yourself are out of gas and you just don't have it. You're going to come up against people that you think are unlovable and why should you love them? So to do what I'm talking about, we're talking about the impartation of the Holy Spirit and putting Jesus Christ as, as the, the, the utmost thing that matters to you, following him is the utmost, not anything else. There is no distant second. There is no second. So when you do that, if you're willing to get radical like that, and, and then you pray, and so you're prayed up as you move through the day, you're, you're, the basis is, what does God think about me? What does God think about this day? What are God's priorities for me in this day? When you're rolling like that, now that's a lot of work already that I've talked about. That, that's a lot of work. But when you're rolling like that, then the kind of thing happens that has happened to me. I've done it to people and people have done it to me. I'm standing in a grocery store line for whatever reason. We're the only two people. The other you know, cashiers have a lot of people. I look over at this woman. She sees me. And, and it happened after daddy died. And, and it was an African-American woman. And she reached over. This is very bold. And she, um, she touched my hand. And she said, I know you're going through something. She said, but I just want to tell you, she said, God loves you. And, she, and, and that was it. And I, I'd, I'd never seen her before in my life and I've never seen her since. That's not someone acting out of character. That is someone who's prayed up and alert to the Holy spirit speaking to you and saying, because just a benevolent person of good character wouldn't have detected. I wasn't standing in line crying. Right. I wasn't obviously dejected. In fact, it caught me off guard because I was having one of my better moments in the office. <laughs> Do I look that bad? Like, right. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't. There wasn't anything. It was, it was, it was right. God's it was the spirit. Yeah. yeah. So this, what I'm hearing, so what I'm hearing is that the radical act of love is our reaching out to love God to learn about Jesus, to deep into prayer, to love. Like, I feel like a lot of children go, well, love me, God, love me. And they pray for the, the you know, I want this and I want that and give me this. And when God shows up and gives you those things, like, oh, God's real. And, but then when that other shoe drops, when you pray for the thing and it doesn't come to pass, and you're like, well, don't you love me anymore? Like, why well, I'm not getting blessed anymore. So what I'm hearing you say radical love is, and this is a, this is a real time thought I'm having, is that, Radical love is our 
our effort to love God, to, to, to seek God, to like fervently move after, to know God and to move into the word and to pray and to fill ourselves up so that we become, so then that radical love, now once we're in a relationship of radical love with our maker, then everything else is like, it's just everything, like the way that we interact in the world, it's like water, we're just shedding off we're shedding that we're in that relationship with God so that everything else is just like, you know, basically does that, am I, I'm not making sense. I can't, my words, I've lost my words, but I'm, I'm, this is, this is me dealing with the world you know, when I'm in relationship with God and it's like water and everything else is just because I'm, I'm not in relationship with people anymore. I'm, it's yeah. me and so, so I spent, um, I mean, I've spent, I've spent years as someone who was an agnostic, some, some, and I've spent, but I've spent the majority of my life as someone who, you know, I would say I was a Christian, but what that meant was, and unfortunately there's a big swath of evangelical Christianity that subscribes to this. And what it means to be a Christian is that you, you pray the sinner's prayer and you get forgiven for your sins and you get eternal life. You get what I call the golden ticket to go to right. heaven. So, you know, when you pass, you're standing there on the celestial highway. You got your golden ticket. St. Peter lands that super deluxe jet that he's got, private jet. Doors open. He's like, you got the golden ticket. Come on in. Then St. Peter takes you. Where are we going? We're going to paradise, brother. You've got the golden ticket. The problem with that is you can pray that. But look, I mean, there is nothing that compares to knowing that you have grieved other people and grieved God and that you've made a mess of your life and other people's lives and repenting of that. So I'm not disparaging that in the least. Without repentance, you can't follow Jesus. Right, right. Jesus is not going to let you follow him when you have massacred people emotionally, psychologically. Jesus is going to say, let's start right there, first of all. Right. So you part. We don't, we don't lobotomize. Jesus is like, I don't lobotomize my followers or give you instant amnesia. And then you just start with a clean slate and you repent. And yeah, there's a reckoning. Yeah. And in terms of, of, of eternal life, I don't disparage that at all because in that, in that interview on joy with Micah, the, I led with the biggest hindrance to joy is the fact that we don't really believe that death is not the end. We, we harbor a suspicion that this might be all there is. And that means that how you're doing at any given moment, the stakes are so high. Right. Right? I mean, the stakes are monumentally high because you just have however many years you have. Whereas when you know that you have eternal life and you know that what you're doing in this life counts in the other life, then it totally changes everything because all that you really need to know is that you're going to show up and God's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome to paradise. Welcome to the party. Because, because you gave everything that you had in seeking to do God's will case closed. Right. And it does matter. And there are people who have gone before you loved ones who have passed and they are watching you and they don't, they don't care terribly if you become the next Bill Gates, that's, that's just not consequential in heaven. But they care very much and applaud and cheer and, and root for you to be like Jesus. Bill Gates is not a big deal when you have eternal concerns and demands. Right. But right. following Jesus is a very, very big deal. So, so I don't disparage eternal life. I think it's very hard to be joyful. And then really what joy amounts to is I've got a given number of years. How many of them were things working out the way that I wanted them to? Whereas if you believe in eternal life, you don't even think that way. You're just like, am I getting the job done? The long-term job, the job that doesn't end when I die? That I'm part of this team and we're trying. So Jesus, what was the gospel? Jesus said the gospel was, I have brought the, I am the gospel and I have brought it. It is the availability of God's kingdom to all men in a radical women, regardless of, of your social standing, whoever you are, formally, it was the province of a certain group of people for good historical reasons. But now Jesus is saying, 
I've opened it up to everyone. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and the little thing that we call the Lord's Prayer says, thy will be done in heaven, thy will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. But the kingdom of God is simply doing what God would have you do. When you follow Jesus, when God's will reigns and rules in your life, you are exhibiting the kingdom of God and you're a part of the kingdom of God. So this idea about getting out of despair, this idea about engaging in acts of radical love, it's simply understanding that you are an outpost of the kingdom of God. And yeah. so everything that everyone else is doing is corrupt when they are self-serving, self-seeking, temporally minded, not eternally minded, worried about these things on this earth, worried about the score, worried about where they stand. But when you do engage in these radical acts of love, the interesting thing is, you know, we talked about this. I, if I need you to approve of me, then I'm bound. I am enslaved to your response to me. And if I need you to love me, then I am bound, I am shackled to your response. But if my concern is that I better you, that I love you, then I'm free. Yeah. Because I need a response from you. I need a response from God. I need to know that well done, my good and faithful servant. So, so it's not, it's also about liberty. That's the terrible thing about social media is because people are actually getting their self-worth from, from a like, yeah. from something that's paltry and puny as a like. People, but it's serious stuff. People commit suicide over these kinds of things. It's, it's very sad, but it's the opposite of, of Jesus, where Jesus is all about you pouring out his spirit into other people. Like a practical example that I'll tell you when, because I started out talking about, you know, I spent years where I was just, you know, I guess I would call myself a Christian you know, because I believed, but there, but my life was, uh, you know, there was no difference in my life at all. And I, in fact, I'm, I might, I mean, I was worse than a lot of my friends who did claim to be Christians, but, but the, but the interesting thing is that, you know, that's kind of what I, I, I would every now and then have moral reform. Uh, you know, my conscience would be, you know, tormented. And I would say, I want to, you know, I want to try to be a Christian, you know, yeah. so it's not following Jesus. Right. But I want to be a Christian, you know, and I don't want to be such a, such an SOB. So let me, let me try to love on some people. So it, it went, because I wasn't practicing what I just said you should practice. It, it <laughs> the results were not spectacular, but, but they were revealing. So on one occasion, I was really trying to pray and I was prayed up that day. And so I just happened to have the mind of God and the spirit of God. And this man came to fix our air conditioner and we had already spent $400. We were broke and we had spent $400 because every time something like $400 just shy of, because every time someone would come out, they charge 75 bucks and no one had fixed it yet. So we'd have four guys and this now was the fifth guy and I mean, and you know, it's summer in Florida. And at that point, Folsom was like three years. It was, it was hell. It's just what, it was so hot in our tiny little house. And here we are broke and like we're scraping together and we're, and no one can fix it. And this guy comes in and he's got, he has a terrible demeanor. He's not nice. And, you know, he kind of disparages the other people who'd come and then he can't get it fixed. And so he starts running in and out of the house and he can't get it fixed. And there was, and he was, he was rude to me and he was rude to Katie. And I almost, there, you know, not some colossal outburst of emotion, but I almost- You're gonna him. break windows or anything. But. Yeah, no, no, right. But I was like, you know, you're being rude to us, you know? I mean, right. we're just sitting here sweating. You get to leave and go get in your car. Um, but I, I walked out with him to the outside, you know, part of the air conditioner and the Holy Spirit just came over me and it was like, you need to, you need to talk to him. And so I said, I just started asking him questions about himself and he burst into tears and he had owned his own company. He had a beach house. Um, he has a second home. He had a, a nice home in Orlando. Um, 
one morning he woke up and his wife was uh, dead, lying next to him dead. She'd had a heart attack in the night. And it had happened about six or seven months prior to this event. And in that short a period of time, he lost his business. He lost his houses. He lost everything. And so he went to work doing what he knew to do. He knew how to fix air conditioners. So he got a job to pay the bills doing that. And he started crying when he told me this. And I just reached over and put my arms around him. And I said, do you mind me praying for you? And he said, I don't mind at all. And he left there and I'm telling you, his whole demeanor changed. And all it was is he's walking around alone with that pain. And because he's alone with that pain, he's defensive. And for some people, defensive means even a little, a little caustic and aggressive in that defensive posture and making sure no one gets close because if you do get close, you're not going to care. Right. So close, you're not going to care. It's going to be trivial to you. And what I'm experiencing is not trivial. So I'm not going to let you get close. It's a completely rational psychological response because most people don't care. Right. So it's best to keep them at bay because when you let them in and you see something as valuable and it's true, but grief is like a, it's like a treasure. It's, it's, it's of utmost importance to you. And then someone just, they don't know how to treat it and they, they, they trivialize it. You don't want to let them in close to your heart. But what I did is I pierced that veil in the Holy Spirit, even me in that state of mind. And I was a long way from being right. It was going to be years before I was going to understand who Jesus was and how to follow him and, and why that was the only thing worth doing with, with my life. But, but even then, because of the, the prayer that I had had, and, and he left completely different and he kept hugging me and it was like, and he's, he was this big dude. He was this big guy and it just, it broke him in the best kind of way. It broke the veil, you know, that, that lies between us as human beings were veiled off from one another. And, and sometimes it's something much stronger than a veil. It's a, it's a wall, a concrete wall, but it shattered that. And on another occasion, it was another guy who was coming to our house to fix something. He was a plumber and, and, there had been a series of plumbers who had shown up and they hadn't fixed it. And we don't have bathrooms and this has been going on for about a week. And so we've, you know, reached the breaking point and, and this guy, and I just said, I mean, you know, it, how is this going to be different than the way it was before? And he said, sir, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get this fixed. And I said, well, you just, you just don't understand. I mean, you know, we obviously look at our house. We, we are not well off people in this little house, but we, we are people who, you know, need to have bathrooms. And, and, and so, you know, and, and, you know, and I was tense and I was, I was angry because I felt like he was, you know, kind of blowing me in the situation off. And what I envisioned was him getting in his truck and leaving. And once again, you know, the problem's not been solved. And he, he looked at me and his, in his eyes um, got really compassionate and, and, and they got, he kind of teared up and he looked at me and he said, I know you're going through a hard time. And he said, and I, I want to tell you, uh, he said that God knows you're going through a hard time. And he said, my morning this morning, he said, I had to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to drive all the way to the beach because there was an elderly woman whose sewer pipes had burst and she had human feces all in her house. And he said, and that's how I spent the first three hours of my day was cleaning that, fixing the pipe and then, and then cleaning that up. And he said, and, and then I had two other things and now here I am with you. And he said, and I just want to tell you, it doesn't really matter. It, it, none of this really matters. He said, well, that you got to let the love of God flow in to your heart. I stood there with <laughs> look on my face that that guy had on his face, the air conditioner repairman. When I said, when I said to him, my jaw dropped and I looked poleaxed. Like it was like someone had hit me in the head with a bat. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this guy like set me right like that because the Holy Spirit came over me and convicted me. And I knew that he was right. And so I walked away and I went inside and I told Katie and she goes, you get back out there and you talk to him. And I didn't want to because I was ashamed for kind of being curt with him and being angry. And I went back out and he saw me coming toward him and he just walked over and put his arms around me because he knew the state of my heart because that dude was prayed up. Yeah. Active character. That wasn't an act of benevolence. That was someone who spends massive amounts of time in prayer and hears from the Holy Spirit. 
That's awesome. You cut off the last little bit. I think it was that you said he's prayed up and he hears from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he hears, he hears from the Holy Spirit because I think that's a critical part of this. To do what I'm talking about, you, you should go around in the day kind of looking at other people, not obsessed, certainly not on your phone and social media. That's horrible. <laughs> that's the worst case scenario. But even well, if you are... But, People. There was a, there was a moment I want to I want to address it. There was a moment where the comment about social media and there's this community. There's these women that have gotten and they actually have real. So they've they've taken social media and they've jumped into real life community with each other, and they made a point of saying, "Well, hold on." But I know what you're saying, where you're just trolling through Instagram and you're lost. You lose hours. Hey, man, Instagram for me is like a cigarette these days. Like I I will go on it. I'll spend five minutes and it's like i've gotten my little nicotine kick it's bad it's like i'm, yeah. I'm it's bad like i've got to figure yeah the hour's up uh right. i gotta i gotta we gotta let people we gotta let people go but i tend Let's to see. pray at the end of well, i don't tend to i always pray at the end of um a show do you want to pray tonight or do you want me to pray i'll if you feel led i'd love for you to pray um sure i'll pray Okay. Father God, I pray Psalms 19 over everything that Chris and I have said. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. And pray that everyone who is listening would be fed and spit out the bones. If there's anything that we've said or discussed that is not right, just spit it out. But I pray that we would have spoken some things that are helpful above all as much as I enjoy talking to Christopher and sharing with him, I just, we just pray that this would be useful for people, bring people a little joy, a little perspective, a little vision. I pray that we would get our eyes set on Jesus and that we would be clear eyed about it and that we would fall in love with him and want to be with him and run to him. And in doing that, you've got everything that you need. So I pray that in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I just love this idea of radical love. You gave me this idea of the more I invest in my relationship with God, the more I read, the more I pray. And every day becomes this almost like a treasure chest of, of who am I going to get to talk to today? Who am I going to get to bless today? Who am I going to love on today? Yeah. And I'll go like three or four days. Dumb as a stump. I mean, just I'm totally like I've lost my spiritual being. But what I don't do, what I, that's how I operated all the time. The difference now is I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep doing this. Whoa, I'm putting the brakes on. I'm gonna go spend a couple hours in prayer. I'm correcting this because I know how good life can be when, when I can hear the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit's always speaking to us. Right. right. We hear, that's the thing. And that's right. where the, it increases our ability to pick up the frequency. And so life is an adventure. I love what you, it's true. Like when you're hearing from God and, so a yeah. complete stranger and you can put a blessing on them yeah how can you be life into somebody you're like hey man i see yeah. you today i see you <laughs> yeah it's incredible yeah you become useful um you're gonna come back next week yeah your new company is uh sackcloth and ashes our new company <laughs> It's a bit of peril. Um, and no, but seriously, what you do have is a website that people can go to. And there's a, you have seven, you, there's a lot of stuff cooking. And there's going to be a lot more content for people to, to digest that you're going to be putting out there in the world. But you do have the half hour video with Micah. It's on YouTube yeah. that people can go watch. And you've got seven episodes of a podcast that I encourage everybody to go listen to because uh, you do have keen, sharp, uh, insightful, wise insights. And the way you impact them is often entertaining and um, enlightening. So I'm super grateful for you jumping on the Chautauqua. I wanna say this before we leave. I asked you to come on to the Chautauqua when this thing started back in 2020. And you said to me, you said, God is working on my heart. I am to be small right now. I've gotta go inside for a while. I'm not ready to talk. And I was like, okay. And I heard what you said, I and, I, and I, I'm going to let Scott do his thing. And so the fact that, like, from 2020 until December, this November of 2020, yeah. what year are we in? Are we 22 right now? 22, about to be 23. About to be 23. Um, yeah. It's interesting, right? Because 
you listen to God and you were like, I've, it's, it's not my time right now to, to I'm not, I'm, and I've, and I know what that feel. I know what you felt. I know. And so, which I respected, but I just, I love that, that there was a prompting. Sometimes there's times to talk and sometimes there's time to just dig into prayer and, and listen and, and be quiet and be small. Yeah. I, we should have led with that because that, that was a real life example of, of me feeling like I might hurt your feelings. Um, but then after that, I see some of my best friends, Tim Griffin comes on your show, Scott yeah. Jones. Your show. Yeah, I was like, what are you friends on? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit's like, keep your mouth shut. I don't want you on anything right now. I don't care if Joel Osteen called you up and said, I want you to preach, you're not doing it. I, you're in my school right now. And my school is exclusive. It's one-on-one -on -one, and we don't do other things until I say you're ready to do other things. So that was heavy, the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, you know, and that's the difference between like building a business and building up a social media presence and all that crap. When the only thing is listening to the Holy Spirit that matters mm -hmm. because you're not engaged in any building up of anything except receiving from the Holy Spirit. And dude, so I knew that that was not going to be blessed. I could have, I could have just broken the, the, the commitment that I'd made. And I said, no, I'm going to do this. And I could have justified it because it's my brother-in-law. It'll hurt his feelings. What's wrong with it? It gives me a chance to speak. But, you know, the problem with all that is the Holy Spirit said, don't you do it. I don't want you speaking. I don't want you talking to other people. I want you hoarding this up. And I want you fattening up on these revelations that I'm giving you. And I want you exclusive to me. I want your eyes set exclusively on me. And so I did it for two years. And then it came back up. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. And that's thing about following Jesus is you're not full of self grandeur and like oh now i will speak or no i can't speak now no you just do what you're told to do well and also you just hit you just hit a really fine point when you're out of god's uh, not grace but when you're out of relationship with god when you're not focused on the god on god and the holy spirit and you let's just say you said building up a brand or worrying about it's right. weird and when God's got you in his palm, the palm of his hand, doors open up, the band, the brand builds, the numbers show up, things happen. Right. Doors. And when you're not like when you're fussing and you're trying to do it's weird when God does it, it feels one way. When you do it, it feels another way. Yeah. You know, yeah. anyway, man, I remember that. That's great. All right. You and I, you're going to come back next week. Yes. Okay, we got one more week. If there's something that you guys want us to talk about specifically, let us know. Put them in the comments because we are um, we're 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 sort of tiptoeing around this subject, uh, but we want to. You know, if, you, if there's anything people want to talk about specifically, we can. Uh, I love you, man. Have an amazing week. Yeah. Uh, we'll. I'll see you next week. All right. See you next week. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye bye. Uh, the long goodbye here.